Hi, welcome to this week's Rocks Talks. I'm Parazad. Faiza. And this week we have the fabulous Christine Yaven. Yay! Hi, Christine. Hi, hi. We're just so excited to have you on here. I know that I started following you during Katie's social shimmy challenge, and I think Parazad did too. And I was just so excited to discover you because I love, 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 love watching you dance. Thank you so much for having me. I feel really honored and really blessed to connect with so many beautiful dancers around the world. And I think that what you guys are doing is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Christine, first of all, congratulations on Rock's Curve. I know that that was a really amazing collaboration you did with a bunch of our favorite dancers here in the United States, two of whom we've already had, well, three actually, because Roxanne, three of whom we've already had on the show, Roxanne Shelby, Chadney Rocks, and Katie Sahar. And I, it was just, it was such a gorgeous show. It was Thank amazing. So I loved, loved the show. Thank you so much. It was really, a, uh, I think, a labor of love for the for the four of us. Me, Katie, uh, Yalia, and Chudney. I don't know if Katie's told you already, but it really was just born out from like a little WhatsApp chat group that Katie and, and I and Yalia have, where we just basically share stuff. Mm -hmm. And we just had an idea one day that we are not seeing the representation that this should be there for bigger dancers um, who are, I think, qualified enough to teach and, you know, perform very well and something like this, but we just don't see it because most of the time people like to promote the hot young thing. It's just the standard of, of beauty. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, one of the things that I love about belly dance is that it really is beautiful on all body types so it's it pleases me that you guys were like there's plenty of shows with you know a bunch of this so let's do let's have more representation yeah. i think that um rock's curve was really important because i feel like in a lot of ways students when they don't see their bodies being represented they get really shy and, and like reluctant to to move forward and push themselves i think that's part of the thing because i, I have a lot of students who are bigger and they're like oh you know when i first started at, um learning my teacher used to comment this and comment that so then i i don't feel like learning anymore and i think that's important i agree with you i took over a class for my original teacher and uh, she's a plus-sized woman and mm -hmm. this student uh, had been in her class for about a month. She she stayed she stayed in it after I took over. But she later confessed to me that if she had walked in and seen me in her first class. She wouldn't have stayed because she didn't feel like I would be able to teach a different body type. Yeah, I think it's really important to have a supportive teacher because a lot of the bigger girls, I think it's not so much that we think, oh, she's not going to be able to teach me. It's just that is she going to get mad at me or like bully me or tell me oh you know you would do this better if you lost weight this kind mm. of a, a scared part and it's not, probably not because of belly dancing it's probably from school from high school when they wanted to join other activities for example um i had an experience when, when before i took belly dancing i was learning ballroom dancing and the teacher was telling me that you know if you lost weight you could start competing and i was like okay well yeah no <laughs> <laughs> because we need it is a partner dance and then they need to lift us up to do the tricks especially for competitions right but but no I totally understand because you made the comment about high school when I was in high school I was on uh, my marching band's color guard team my coach was always on all the girls to lose weight even one of the skinniest girls that was on the team who was modeling she was so athletic she was you know she was in soccer she was a model she was she was beautiful she was very slender but because like you couldn't see abs this woman was on her to lose five pounds too and then like if somebody was getting dizzy in rehearsal because like they hadn't eaten lunch that day or something then she'd be like why aren't you eating and it's like but I can say the internalized monologue for me at a lot of the times, because this dance, you know, this dance is difficult. It's very muscular. So you have to work very hard to train yourself to be able to do moves, no matter what your size is. But there are times like, you know, that I would, when I'm trying to learn this dance, and I'm like, it doesn't quite look this way. You know, part of it is, is that, you know, I'm always taking from teachers who have been training for at least 15 years longer than I have. So part of it is 15 years of, practice and dance experience that I don't have, but there is a part of me that always thinks like, if I lost weight, this would look better. And that's something that I have to fight myself every day to be like, or you could practice more. <laughs>
And I, I also think that because of the different body sizes, the movements look different, which is great because we're not part of a chorus line. We're not dancing on the theater with like 10 girls behind you doing exactly the same thing. Exactly. So it's, we have a little bit of individuality and it's just from our shapes and our, and our sizes, it looks different. So I think it's really great. That's one of the things that makes us all individual, I think. The analogy that I always use is there is no one type of beauty. The lily and the rose look nothing alike, are both beautiful. And that is truly one of the things I love about belly dance. It just looks beautiful on all body types. And it's, it's diversity is part of what is so, what draws me to it. Exactly. I mean, that's that's been my whole, um, these past couple of years, I've been working a lot about teaching students how to be unique artists. And, and it, this is something that's really important. Ugh, it's like, makes me so ugh, frustrated when I see you know, 10 different girls who have the same body types. Okay, they can't help that, so that's fine. But then they have the same hairstyle, they have the same earrings, they wear the same costume, they dance exactly the same way because they learned a choreography from somebody, and then they do it exactly the way that the, the teacher does it. And then I'm like, okay, it's really wonderful to see a, a very proficient and, and um, technical dancer, but then it's like, okay, Miss A, Miss B, Miss C, they all look the same to me. Part of the thing is, how do you project your soul to your audience? How do you experience that, that exchange of love and energy with your audience if all you're doing is, is being a cookie cutter of somebody else? I mean, like, let's say I go to Jelena's class and I really try to learn her chore choreography and really try to nail it so that my technique improves. But then when it's time for me to go perform, I, I need to be me because Jelena is already there. We don't need a world of Jelena's. We don't need a world of Sadie's. I would rather have Jelena and Sadie and Perizod Christine and Katie, you know, that's <laughs> so much more interesting to me. <laughs> and I think that it's just also their personalities are different, their body shape is different, and their their life experience is also different from us. So while it's good to, to study the choreography and get it down and whatever, but when you perform it, you don't have to do it exactly down to the look. That's just mm. scary to me, you know? That's really, I'm like, oh, okay, well, where are you? So I started this thing called Christine's Technique Hacks. And basically it's it's just little videos to show people how to, how to adjust certain techniques for their body. Because, you know, being from Asia, I have students who are really, really slim with very, very small hips. And then of course, students who are my size as well. So, and everybody else in between. Because what you can do doesn't look the same on, on my body. And what somebody else does doesn't look the same on my body. So there are these little technique hacks to make the, the for example, a shimmy look better on someone like me who has no hips and like a large midsection. And when we do the normal 4-4 Egyptian shimmy, I, you can't see it on me uh, mm. unless I turn to face the back. But uh, so then there's like little technique hacks that you can do to help you make the movement more obvious and um, safer. Um, I, I met a dancer in, in Australia and she was telling me, she's probably around my age, 40s, something like this. And she was saying she can't dance today because her knees are having problem and she can't do arabesque. And I was thinking, okay, but why? Because there's no reason to use your knee when you're you know, doing an arabesque. And then I showed her my way and she was like, oh my God, you know, what the hell is this? And I was like, yeah, this is just my way of doing it so that I don't even have to twist my knee at all. And it helps save us because, you know, of course, being bigger, our knees are really, you know, more sensitive because of all the extra weight. So I have to find little adjustments to do that. Also in my country, being uh, East Asian or like wider, people don't want to hire you. I mean, mm. let's talk about the weight, just the color as well. So it's like completely the opposite of what we see in the US where it's like darker dancers don't get hired. But over here, it's like, unless you're white or brown, you don't get hired. So, you know, so people like of East Asian, like Chinese or anybody who looks too East Asian, we don't get hired. They always ask for somebody who looks Indian or Arabic, but like darker Arabic, not the whiter ones. Or, um, oh, or do you have any Russians? <laughs> That's what I get. <laughs> 
So uh, how did you get into belly dance in the first place? Well, I was doing ballroom dancing, right? After my teacher told me to lose weight, then I was looking for something else to take up my time because I like dancing and it's a good form of exercise. So I started taking classes while I was in uh, doing my master's degree in Australia. But it was really casual, like, you know, once a week uh, for a couple of months, and then I would take a break and then I'd go back again, you know, stuff like this. Then after that, I came back to Indonesia and I started uh, looking for a studio, but nobody was teaching at that time. Mm. So after a few years, I started working and I kept on looking. I wanted to keep looking for a studio. No, nobody was teaching. And then I found one studio uh, that, that opened that advertised that they had belly dancing classes. So I went and the teacher was a local lady and I was like, okay, this is really exciting. I'm really excited, you know, because I don't know anything about belly dancing. I took like, what, less than a year in Australia. I went to this woman's class and turns out that she was a hip hop teacher. She made us dance on a yoga mat. So we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't step outside of the yoga mat. So this is, I was like, this is weird. I mean, my teacher in Australia didn't do, do it this way. And then she made us do all these back bends while doing like huge twists with our hip and back bend, twist with our hip and all these like flailing arms and all of that. So I, you know, I was like, this is weird. But after class, what got me is that she came up to me and you know she asked me so you're new where are you from blah 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 and i was like oh yeah i'm you know i'm from here uh i just came back you know from australia and um i had took belly, took belly dance classes there then she touched my stomach like this you know and she's like oh she's like okay well don't worry you know you'll be a good belly dancer when you lose some weight and that got me really upset because i was thinking not only are you teaching wrongly because who teaches belly dance on a yoga mat okay and then she's spreading all this misinformation about that you need to lose weight or you need or belly dance will make you lose weight when this is to me the only dance that is more open to all sizes you know she got me so mad that i decided not to go for, to her anymore yeah because i'm not wasting my money and i just started to to try to find private teachers outside of indonesia and luckily enough i was i was working for an international company so they sent me for lots of training outside of indonesia like to Singapore and to Malaysia and there there's a quite a big scene in those countries so I went and I took private lessons um, and then the tsunami happened in 2004 uh, the big tsunami of South, in Southeast Asia and the year after Tamil and Dalal came to Indonesia to do some volunteer work and she was also writing her book 40 days and 1001 night yeah so somehow I had the chance to meet her because one of my teachers in Malaysia knows her and she's the one who was like, you know what, if, if nobody is teaching in Indonesia, you should teach. And I was like, yeah, but I'm, I don't know anything. When I first started, I really did not know anything. I didn't even think about wanting to teach. I had a good job. I mean, I was working in a bank and then I was working in, in, um, a, in a retail company and you know I was like the brand manager you know it was like a, a good job um and my mom thought I was crazy but anyway so <laughs> Tamlin came and she helped me to gain confidence I, I took private lessons with her and coaching and at that time I didn't even know what what I wanted she was just said just try and then so I did I I taught on weekends and I and I had a full-time job I had three students I made little stupid flyers I put them in the coffee bean and the Starbucks and it just grew from there because the, the media found out because now it's like the first belly dance teacher in in Jakarta and it snowballed from there uh, although now it's like <laughs> It, it's up and down, of course. Um, there are times when I had like lots and lots of students, but there are times like now when it's like seven, ten. You know? And with so many other um, options for people, like you know, some people just want to, they don't really want to dance. They just want to feel glamorous or sexy. Mm -hmm. They think that belly dancing is sexy. And I tell them it's not. It's a lot of hard work for a little bit of sexy. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm like, if you really want to be sexy, why don't you go and learn striptease dance or something? You don't have to learn about the culture or the music or the rhythms or, you know, Om Kasum and stuff like that. I think that that's one of the things that really pushes me to learn more is because when I see, if I just wanted to be insular and just stay in Indonesia where nobody else learns, literally nobody else learns except for my students, I, I can just do this and I can be the best in Indonesia and whatever and you know that kind of stuff but that's not cool there is no glamour or no excuse to just be stuck in who where you are and just be very um internal looking it's it, it's people like you people like Katie people like Yali who keep learning and keep 
trying to strive for excellence that keeps me like, oh, yep, I have to do that too. And I keep pushing my students as well. You better learn because no matter how advanced you are, technique is all, you always need to do technique. You always need to learn more. There is always something to learn more. And the more I learn, the more I feel like I don't know anything. <laughs> Totally. That's how I always feel. Yes. yes. <laughs> the more I learn, the more I'm reminded of how very little I know. <laughs> totally. And and then of course you get imposter syndrome, especially being everything online nowadays. So it's like, mm, but blinders helps a lot. You know, you always need to be, you always need to be improving and you always need to be learning. But I think there's always going to be a need to like, just have patience with yourself because, you know, I'm so much further along in my knowledge than I was when I was 18 and I thought I was like the cutest, hottest little thing. Thank God. But you know, I'm nowhere near like Sahra Saida, who is a cultural anthropologist and does her whole talks on like journey through Egypt or, you know, Amani Jabril, who has her doctorate in anthropology. And like, I'm probably never going to be at that level. And I need to be okay with that because I just, I don't have the time. I don't have the inclination to drop the money for a master's and a PhD in culture anthropology, but I keep learning, you know, when, when Kareem Nagy or somebody like that is teaching a workshop and he's going to teach rhythms and he's going to talk about music from a specific region. And, you know, I'm not working that day and I have the money to do it. I can go take that class and I can learn a little more and I need to be okay. You know, continue to push yourself to learn, but you always, like you say, you just kind of, just got to know that there's so, there, you're never going to know all of it. I totally agree. I think for our own sanity, you have to know who you are. Yeah. I am a researching kind of person. All of these facts just like I don't I don't remember. But I I get the general gist of it. And I also tell my students that of course we all have a finite amount of resources, time, money and all of this. So choose the best one that's for you. You don't have to learn all of this nitty gritty, let's say now the big topic is about macams, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need to know exactly which macam, like da da da, and then what's the feeling for this? No, but you do know that there are macams. You do know you need. You do need to know the five or six most popular macam names. You do need to know that Samai Bayati da 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 means you know this is the macam name. This is the composer name. This kind of stuff. But you don't need to know all of the little details. Uh, because we're not musicians, we are dancers at the end of the day. If you have an interest, go ahead, you know, go learn it. But um, I think that some people get this kind of a FOMO. Is it called FOMO? Fear of yeah, missing, fear of missing out. Missing out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and it's really strong because we're like, oh, and now that the whole world is opened up, I can take courses everywhere. So it's like this. Oh. I feel like I saw that you lived on the East Coast. I think that's where I got it from. You live like... You went to school in Pennsylvania, right? So I did so one year in San Diego, and then I moved to Boston for half a year, and then I did the rest of my uh, studies in Philadelphia. So was oh, this wow. before you started dancing? Yes. Oh, before. darn. I was going to ask how it differed. <laughs> but darn. I can tell you about Australia. Yeah, yeah, tell us. Okay, I started in Australia learning in Australia, but Australian belly dancers are, are some of the most underrated belly dancers in the world. You never hear about them because they're so far away, you know, and then they, they hardly travel out because it's so expensive. Those girls are one of the most humble, humble girls that I have ever met. Almost all of them are really like into studying and training more. So they'll take, for example, Sahar Saida's journey through Egypt. They'll take this course. They'll take that course. They're really, really hardworking, amazing uh, women. And a lot of them are also into like learning about folk dances and folk culture. And especially in Sydney, I have a very good friend. Her name is Rachel Bond, and she is um, one of the hardest working dancers I've ever I've ever seen. You know, like really into educating herself and her students and the community around her. So it's really great. The other thing is that they don't have it is. I think it's their culture. If you've watched Master Chef. MasterChef US and MasterChef Australia are completely different. It's like even the set, the set of MasterChef US is like dark and then they have like neon lights and then the judges are really nasty and then the competitors are really nasty to one another. It's like, you know, if I don't win, you can't win either, that kind of thing. So in Australia, MasterChef Australia is like the kitchen is sunny, there's a lot of white, there's a lot of like, uh, you know, inspiring colors. And then the judges are like, 
you did really well here or you did, you know next time do better and then each contestant is like these are adult contestants not the kids the adult contestants are like do better next time we're here to support you and i'm like wow <laughs> it's so nice yeah. Yeah, but in the US, it's like you know <laughs> like this and then australia's like you did you know this that was a good effort you know but that is it's really interesting though but then on the other hand then you have a lot of competitions in in the us but in australia there are hardly any competitions for, for dance in the dance world, which is good and bad. Because for me, I think the competitions are good in the sense that it really pushes you. You have a time, uh, you have a deadline that is fixed. You have to get this done before this date and you have to try your best. So that's the good and bad. With my students, I always tell them that if they join competitions, you have to think of it as, I am not going to win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because yeah, because I am only competing with myself. So then when they go in, they try their best. And it's not about just, I'm going to do a competition and I'm just going to chuck on any old costume and do any old choreography. You need a mentor to prepare you for the steps of doing the competition and then get the feedback from the judges, you know. Although on that saying that some judges are give really bad feedback. <laughs> One judge told my student, not in, um, she went to a competition um, outside of Indonesia and he's an Egyptian guy and he told my student that she needs to lose weight. And she's probably a size 12, a US size 12, something like this. You know, and I was like, what is that all he said? Oh yeah, that's all he said. And he said, oh, work on your technique. I'm like, oh, that doesn't mean anything. That means, yeah, I hope not at all. <laughs> One of our previous hosts, Andali, said that she specifically tells her judges, body comments are off the table. It's not helpful. If you need to tell them that you couldn't see a particular move they were doing, tell them that, that you couldn't see a particular move that they were doing. So that way they can do some of Christine Yavin's, you know, tips and tricks and hacks <laughs> yeah. uh, to make it more obvious. But, you know, saying I couldn't see this move because I think you're, you know, I think you're overweight. Like that's not, it's not helpful. The thing yeah. is, and this goes to one of my big rants during every election. I am a feminist and I want to vote for the best person for the job. A lot of times I think that that's a woman. There's still the whole thing of, yeah, but is, is she electable? She's electable if you freaking vote for her. And it's the same thing. You can be successful, you know, in your dance community if people freaking go and watch you. Bring it around back to Rock's Curve. That's one of the things that I'm so happy about is like I, so many different show shows are happening through this whole uh, pandemic where we're finally getting to see not just who the restaurant owner wants to see. We get to see who we want to see because we're actually we're making friends with each other on social media. Commercial success comes from people showing up. I think one of the things that I've been really, even before the pandemic started, there was kind of a push to be more supportive of source dancers or source musicians. It's like all the festivals keep hiring all of these homogenous dancers who are really good. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from them, they're all very similar. There's always been this kind of like, well, why can't why why can't we have take classes with so and so? Why can't we take classes? Dancers out there in the world, if you want to see more diverse dancers, more diverse teachers, you gotta show up. Show up yep. with your dollars. Being a, um, a producer myself with festivals and stuff like that. It is really hard though, because uh, to change. So I must say that it, that it does boil down to the customer, to the client. Yeah. So if, for example, I did a festival called Festival El Rakesa in Jakarta, and I hired, and I always hired three, three teachers. One of them I hired as a older, more cultural kind of teacher. And then the middle one, I would hire someone who is kind of uh, famous and knowledgeable at, for now, like still um, not relevant, but I would say like still popular now. Mm -hmm. And then I would hire a hot young thing. Uh, of course, also a great dancer and a teacher, but right. hot young thing to, to grab 
at the attention of, of whoever is like doesn't care about the the cultural one and that and I found that this kind of um, a mix was really good because then I would force people to learn uh, more than what they want to learn just that's that's hot right now I've been really grateful to people like Tamlin to people um, in Czech Republic who hired me to to, to teach workshops uh, in Australia too that like I said I, I'm who am I I'm from Indonesia you know I, I'm fat if you just look at my my dance videos it's it's like okay I can't even see what she's doing for example um, <clears throat> or it's not as spectacular as like flipping my hair and all of this kind of stuff um, and then plus the fact that I am fat so then it's it's even more of a risk you know for for these people to hire me so I've been really grateful to the ones who really do do believe in me uh, recently I was part of a, a festival in the UK called Inspire Festival by Charlotte Desorger and she hired me and she was like yep just come you know I I'm not the headliner and I'm not that famous um, but but you know but at least she had the um, you know to try so I think that it's important for producers to, to try at least you know okay fine if, if you're scared of losing money then don't just hire that one diverse and not so popular but, but maybe you can hire two or something like this and have like a mix and force people to take the workshops <laughs> We're here for forcing people to learn. We're all about yeah. that. Yeah, we're, we're all about that. <laughs> so tell us about more about your classes. At the moment, I'm teaching just technique classes for the local market for my local students. But I teach specialty workshops usually on the weekends, on Saturdays. So coming up tomorrow, actually, I'm actually collaborating with a, with a Spanish Arabic music teacher. Her name is Irene Shams. And she has a wonderful page on Instagram. If you have, if you're not following her, her it's called musicfordancers.en. And I, I met her first time when I was in Andalus camp in Spain, Nesma's camp, and it was in for Andalusian dance. But I love the way she teaches music. What she does is, well, this is I don't remember the whole thing because I'm not the time person. <laughs> I only remember the first day. So I like the first day so much because she she basically divided music into the beat and the rhythm and she got us like clapping and singing along so that it's more of a enlightened understanding of what the what makes the rhythm and how are we dancing to the rhythm and how are we dancing to the beat so then i came up with this four-week course with her so we're going to talk about music in general and how it relates to dance um one of the things that i because i've been on instagram for a while and i look at people's dancing I find that a lot of dancers don't listen. So no, no, no. It's, it's, no okay, so I find that a lot of dancers don't listen to the music in the sense that how the music is phrasing and how that they should be dancing to this phrase. So even before the phrase is finished, they've already stopped and then they're already going somewhere else. Mm. And, and this is for a lot of um, experienced dancers too, and they're very technically amazing. But I just feel like this connection. It needs somebody to explain to them what it is and not not from a dancer's point of view. I think a, a musician or a music teacher's point of view and she's a singing coach too. So that's why I think that that's really important for her to, to tell people, okay, this is the person singing. You don't you know, stop halfway from when Beyonce is uh, singing, for example, to the left, to the left, everybody da, da, to, to the left. And then before she's finished singing to the left, to the left, and you're like going somewhere else. For <laughs> So on Saturdays is my specialty course. In April, I will be teaching a hands and arms four week course, which I think will be cool. Plus it's Ramadan for us here. So I don't teach um, my usual weekday class. So it'll just be Saturdays. Christine, you also, you also interview people. Yes. <laughs> tell us more about your interviews. Uh, but actually, I, I don't think of them as interviews. I always tell them that it's just talking. <laughs> Um, kind of like what we're doing here, which that's is what, yeah, because that's what we try to do. Just let's just yeah. chat. <laughs> yeah, it's just chat, and and I'm not a very good um, interviewer anyway, but I am very interested in a lot of things that they have to say and make a joke and stuff like that. So conversations with Christine was something that I started uh, on Instagram only, basically because I felt like people need to hear inspirational people mm -hmm. uh, because during the lockdown last year I think that a lot of people lost their mojo me included so it was part of trying to get it back uh, trying to get this love for the dance back uh, trying to survive losing all your students and only having five students left something like this 
um, and to think and to keep reminding ourselves why we are still doing this when everything is falling apart. For a lot of us, it is really falling apart. In, in Australia, they're they're doing really well. They're already back in in studio classes without masks, which is great. I don't know about in the states. Um, some places already started with masks in Europe, which is which is great. Uh, for me here, because our medical system is so bad, so we don't know if the numbers that they're reporting is correct or not. So that's why I'm scared to start until more vaccinations have been done or something like this. And it's completely devastated my school. I don't have any more beginner students left. I have maybe like two new people who just found me on Instagram. But yeah, but that's the whole reason why I started it. Just to get inspired again, just to keep reminding ourselves that this is this is something worthwhile that we're doing. I really think that it's really important that people hear people's stories because it's not just it's not just all about belly dancers are fluffy and like, you know, airheads and we just want to dance because we love dancing and we love to perform. It's not about that because if it was about that, then it wouldn't have lasted so long. And and the connection with the music is the most important and how it makes us feel. It's this, I've told people that belly dance in my life because before I learned belly dance, I was had such low self-esteem and low self-confidence and I'm going to get emotional talking about this, but you know, and, and um, this dance, except for that first teacher that I met. I don't even want to call her teacher. That first first person, everybody else has been really supportive of me. Of course, some people are not, um, you know, I'm fat and whatever. They don't like my style, whatever. But most people have been really supportive. I have so many amazing friends all over the world who have schools and who have asked me to, to teach and like, you know, teach their students. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm so fat and I'm not even such an experienced teacher like back then. But they're like, never mind, just come, just come, you know. And I, I know you. I like what you do. I'm with you. I, uh, I had pretty bad self-esteem as well before I started dancing, and you know, obviously, I still struggle with it. But now I'm also really full of myself. So <laughs> it's okay to be full of ourselves once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> but it, it is. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we get so emotional when we talk about the stances because yeah. it, it's our moment to take our power back and be like, nope, I'm deciding that I'm good enough and that I'm pretty enough and whatever it is that I need to be that's enough to do this dance in this moment. The dancers of the culture, I feel like the belly dancers who are in Egypt, who are in Lebanon, who are in Turkey, I feel like these are like feminists who are there. I mean, like, you know, some of them are in it because of situations, but you know, but just by dancing, they are making a stand and like, you know, saying that, you know, this is my feminine power and I'm going to do it. And I know all of you guys, what you guys think of me, but I'm still going to do it. For a lot of them, it's, it's, it's who they are and what they, what they're meant to do with their life. Yep. And, and I think that's really amazing, especially in, in a country that doesn't um, value women as much. In, in my country, it's the same too. We don't value women as much. It's, yeah. it's, it's all about taking the power. You make a really good point. I mean, who's going to tell Fifi that she needs to sit down? <laughs> so, uh, Christine, before we let you go, uh, where on social media can we find you? I'm on Facebook as Christine Yaven, Y-A-V-E-N, and on Instagram, it's Christine Yaven, that's it. <laughs> well, Christine, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has just been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you today about all the subjects that we've covered, really. I'm so, so happy to, to speak to you ladies. It's been really fun. and really really fun I, I just can't ma imagine that we are halfway across the world and we're chatting like we're having our tea and you know we, we just need some cake and they'll be perfect <laughs> oh yes that actually totally. sounds fabulous it does it does <laughs> well that was christine yaven christine thank you so much for joining us um it was just fabulous to talk to every talk about everything that we did we look forward to the workshops that uh you're going to be teaching in april but otherwise, that's what we have for this week. My name is Parazog. I'm Faiza. And uh, please give us a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Masalama. Masalama.